Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension Service here in beautiful Hernando County. And joining me today is one of our master gardener volunteers, Bernie. Good morning, Bernie. How are you? I'm doing pretty good considering and, and yourself. <laughs> well, that's good. Could be a whole lot worse, I guess. And also joining us is our Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator, Colby Pitts. Colby, how you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, good morning, everybody. I see you dropped the new, finally, uh, from my introduction. Yeah, you're not new anymore. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> now I'll have to transition into old. He's just the old coordinator. Ah. Uh... <laughs> That's okay. One day we need to get our previous coordinator back on here as a special guest. So I need to do much better at getting guests to come on to share their expertise and, you know, the areas that they're, you know, very knowledgeable in. Uh, so as always, if anybody watching us live has any questions about lawn, landscapes, vegetable gardening, trees, plants, water, soils, fertilizers, insects. I can go on for a while here. If you have any questions about those topics, go ahead and put them in the chat and we will show your question and do our very best to help answer them. And if you're watching this recorded, go ahead and put your questions in the comments. And I do my very best to go back after the fact and see if, if there's any comments on there and questions and answer them. Or if you'd like, you can just shoot me an email. People do it all the time. Every day I get emails with pictures and questions. And a lot of times it takes me a day or two or sometimes three to get back to people. But I will eventually get caught up on my emails and get back with you. So please be patient. And I'll do my best to answer your question, send you some links for further reading and more information, and we'll help you figure out whatever your lawn and garden problem is. So, we have regular viewer Corey on here today. And Corey, yeah, you're Corey now, so you're not Facebook user. If you watch us live through a Facebook group, you have to click a button to give Facebook permission to use your name. Otherwise, what I see is Facebook user. And I don't really know what your name is other than Facebook user. But if you're watching us through a Facebook page or through YouTube, your name will show up. So we know who you are when you're asking questions. And we can respond to you by name. So... So, Bernie, did I see a, um, a turf grass sample back on your desk this morning? Very interesting sample. Uh, uh, the, the nice part about it is it's in a plastic bag. But that other than that, uh, it, it doesn't really meet what we would consider normal requirements for a sample. Uh, you know, the, the, the problem occurs in the transition. And this is nothing but a bag of, of dead grass. But the, the interesting thing is they they ask if it's take all root rot. And for once, I have dead grass that has the root structure pretty much intact, which means that it's not take all root rot causing the problem. Now, I don't know why the lawn died. Uh, there's a lot of things we need to uh, investigate. But this particular example is not take all, probably uh, 95 out of 100 samples, that's the problem. But this, yep. this problem, uh, one, I, I need to know uh, what it looks like at the transition. So I've, I've called the people and uh, waiting for them to call back. And, and ex I will explain that, uh, bring me a piece where it's green on one side and brown on the other. And uh, hopefully we can determine what's going on. Uh, it, the uh, dead grass pieces there are only about an inch and a half long, which is uh, typical so often uh, of, of lawns that have been mowed way too short. This this, yep. this particular grass should never be mowed shorter than four inches, and it is. But 
the general condition, because of the root structure, uh, even though it's dead, it, it is pretty pretty good for uh, uh, mowed grasses that's that short. Uh, I would say everything was, was probably going pretty well until whatever uh, happened killed it. You know, dumb things. Uh, somebody's got a, a lawnmower that's, that's leaking gasoline when they mow. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they make a dead trail right through the lawn. That, that's kind of an interesting thing. Or uh, somebody drove over the lawn or this particular pack uh, sat with uh, water on it for a week or uh, this particular pack. Uh, actually, it's damp enough that uh, I, I can't claim that it, it didn't get watered, but uh, it, it's one of those obscure things. Hopefully, uh, the, I'll get with them this afternoon and, and we'll do a little detective work and see what we can find out. Okay, yeah, I know that we have been having uh outbreak of take all root rot. I've been answering a lot of questions about that. A week or two ago, I had to go to speak at a um, homeowner's meeting in a local new neighborhood that I'd never been to before. I'd driven past it, but I'd never actually been into the neighborhood. And Colby's boss was there also, to several of his bosses. And I guess lucky for Colby, he didn't have to go. <laughs> Because they got nasty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were pretty mean. <laughs> and they were upset about uh, watering restrictions and getting fined for watering at the wrong time and dead lawns. And a lot of people hated their HOA. And the HOA people were there to argue back. And it got kind of contentious. I wasn't, thankfully, I wasn't like in the middle taking all the fire. I was just kind of listening and trying to figure out what the problem was. And eventually I got to the point where all their problems basically trailed back to their lawns being cut too short and they have a lot of take all root rot there. And they're trying to fix that by watering more and that doesn't work. Watering more doesn't fix your dead or dying lawn if it has the disease. And that's what a lot of their problems were. You know, they're, uh, the builder there apparently was telling everybody who was having a house built or was buying a house, they said, well, you have to have St. Augustine grass because the county says so. And the county doesn't say so. Hernando County, if you live in a, outside of Hernando County, it may be different. But Hernando County does not um, definitely not designate what kind of turf grass you can and cannot have. I think... Go ahead, Bernie. Okay, I had a, had a lady in uh, last Thursday, right after the uh, program, and uh, her lawn was dying, and it was the, the classic take all. And and her uh, lawn care specialist, who's been in the business for twenty years, mm -hmm. has been treating for take all, for not for take all, but for chinch bugs. And he's he's convinced her that she had chinch bugs and. And she brought a really large sam uh, sample, and there wasn't an insect anywhere in that sample. There, there should have been uh, 15, 20 various insects. Uh, it, it was that big. And uh, I explained to her that it was take all, and it, that people that had been in the business a long time blamed everything on chinch bugs. That was uh, the number one problem 20 years ago. And although they've sprayed enough that we don't really have chinch bugs in the county anywhere anymore, uh, uh, she she was one of these people that, that saw the light, understood exactly what was going on, and decided she would do her own lawn care. So we spent uh, probably an hour going over uh, everything that she needed to know to, to take care of the lawn. And, and the interesting thing is, if, if you do it yourself and you do it right, it takes a lot less maintenance than if you're paying these people to come in and do something every month. You, you don't have to do anything uh, in several months. And, and when you mow, don't mow it so short. Don't mow it so often. And, and it's amazing. The, the lawn pretty well uh, improves, gets better, looks nicer, and, and costs less. And Corey, I, I see we're uh, 
PASCO doesn't dictate specific graphs. I don't think that uh, anybody really specifically says it has to be a type of, of graph. But then you also have to remember that we only have maybe four or five varieties of grass period that are going to grow in this area. So you're going to have to have one of those mm -hmm. and every one of them requires unique spatial care. Yeah, I believe local governance cannot dictate what type of grass you can have, but your HOA can and they do. You can fight that in court, but you have to go to court to fight that. Mm -hmm. Or you could work with your neighbors and residents and base and change the rules of the HOA because they're not they're not written in stone. You can get involved. You can go to the meetings. You can get elected to be, you know, president, vice president, or some other position, and you could work towards changing those rules, because it, it, it's really sad to see na neighborhoods, especially where you have older people or retirees living there, and maybe when they bought the house in the neighborhood, it seemed like a great idea. Oh, everybody has to have St. Augustine lawns. This neighborhood looks really good. My my property values are going to stay up. We're not going to have junk cars in the driveways. Mm -hmm. But then when your lawn dies over and over and you're having to pay to replace it, it can get very, very expensive. And I've spoken with, you know, retired people and they say, I just can't afford to replace this lawn every one, two, three years. So, well, under the current rules, the way they are, they can kind of force you to. And you're just going to have to, you know, that's the cost of living in that neighborhood unless you work towards getting the rules changed. And some neighborhoods have changed the rules. They allow Bahia grass and they put in Bahia grass and the Bahia grass is thriving and doing well. And all of a sudden their cost for having nice looking lawns in the neighborhood is dropping, which is always good. The, the problem is when, when you have all these lawns where uh, you're not allowed fencing or anything in the front yards. So you, you look down the, the row and, and it's uniform, block to block to block. And, and obviously, Bahia grass doesn't look the same as St. Augustine. Zoysia mm -hmm. doesn't look like either one of them. And if, if you have different grasses, you have a different color of green, uh, and it becomes patchwork. It doesn't have that uniform, beautiful look all the way down. And the fact that it costs you an extra 3000 a year to maintain the color of your front yard. Uh, some neighborhoods, they don't mind that. Uh, neighborhoods where you, you don't have people with tons of money to just throw away. They, they tend to think that uh, probably uh, non-uniformity is fine as long as you're not spending that 3000 a year. But if, yeah. if you want to go with all monoculture and it doesn't make any difference what it monoculture is, as soon as everything is identically the same, all you need is one problem, one one bug, one disease, uh, one anything that, that attacks it, and it attacks everybody. So, you know, the, the uniformity that you get doesn't last long because something comes along and destroys it. And, and it's a very, very, very expensive lesson, but monocultures don't work at all unless you're a farmer. And farmers spray like crazy to, to, so they can keep doing it. But, you know, mm. for the, the homeowner, you don't all want the same tree. Every, if everybody had an elm tree, they'd have Dutch elm disease. Yeah. <laughs> if everybody has St. Augustine, they have take all root rot. If, if everybody has anything the same, you know, there there is a problem that will come along, find it, and attack it. So monoculture is... is not good and and you know and it's the same with people if you have all six foot brown eye uh brown haired people somebody's going to come along and and ruin the whole thing so <laughs> you know it, it just doesn't work no matter how hard you try the uh i i just recently read an article from the florida bar i'll put a link to it in the comments here uh it's basically says I mean, 
as part of the Florida statute that uh, establishes Florida friendly landscaping, your HOA is not allowed, and this is what uh, Dr. Lesh was talking about where you have to fight it in court, but your HOA is not allowed to keep you from uh, practicing Florida friendly landscaping. Uh, and there are all of the citations and stuff are in that article. Um, it's it's actually kind of interesting where you can avoid being fined if you can prove that you are doing Florida friendly landscaping uh, practices with your. I, I I think it's I I think there's a lot of stuff on the ground cover alternatives because like you said I don't think many of the HOAs here mandate that it must be San Augustine I'm sure that some of them do but uh, from my experience most of them don't well some do and that was just a holdover from uh, when it was first being built mm -hmm. so builders are the ones who write up the original covenants for homeowners association rules and they do it for obviously their best financial interests. So to have the the neighborhood in absolutely perfect St. Augustine grass, when their investors come through, they say, ah, oh, the neighborhood looks good. We'll loan you another couple million dollars to build phase two and phase three. So five, 10, 20 years down the road, builders long gone, it's up to the homeowners to make those rules. And we do still have some that are holed over only St. Augustine, and a homeowner could argue that Bahia is Florida friendly also, but unfortunately, because I read the same article that um, you, you put the link up to, mm -hmm. a burden of proof is on the homeowner to prove what they're doing is Florida friendly, not specifically on the HOA to prove it's not. And if they don't agree, you can always go to court. And they do. And unfortunately, HOAs have a lot of money. <laughs> and depending on who's in charge of the HOA, they may decide to just spend all of it on a court case. Because we don't want Bernie to have Bahia grass in his yard. He needs to toe the line and follow the rules and have St. Augustine like all the rest of us. Mm -hmm. and if we get a frost, that Bahia is going to turn brown until the weather gets warm again. You know, And so that would mean that one person's lawn could look brown. Mm. Or if you all have St. Augustine, everybody's going to have brown spots from take all at the same time, and uh, it's going to look uniform. Uniformity is important, and, and that's why they have these architectural review people. And, uh, you know, if you can convince them, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that... If, if you mow high and, and, and really water the stuff right, you, you can pretty well get around all those watering restriction problems. And that uh, even, even St. Augustine uh, will survive one day a week watering. And, uh, but it's got to have really good care. You know, it has to be healthy because if, if it isn't perfectly healthy, there's, there's a, a couple of months where it's going to be under stress and and if it isn't capable of withstanding a couple of months of stress then then you're right you cannot get by with with uh the watering that we've got so uh you know it it becomes a a, a thing where if if, if you've got a, a child that doesn't know what he wants to do talk him into becoming an honest to god lawn guru and, and open up a, a lawn business because there are so few people out there doing lawns that, that have any clue what they're doing. Uh, I, I think you could make really, really good money. That, that, uh, you know, people would pay if, if, if they got good results. And good results don't mean that every time the guy comes by, something happens that's visible. Good results means that year round, it pretty much looks uniform and, and uh, doesn't have any big swings in, in the way it looks. So, uh, and the, the people that can do that are very, very few because um, the, the initial thing is if you're out of work and you own a pickup truck and a mower, you go in the lawn business. Yeah, very and, easy to get into. And after you do that for a couple of years, 
um, a good job comes along and now you quit. And, and about the time you're, you're actually learning something and, and know a little bit about bonds, you leave the business. And if you've got one of the big green companies, the guys that started it knew what they were doing. I mean, it was, I, I give them credit for that. Somebody somewhere along the line understood how to take care of lawns. Well, as, as they moved up the line, they could, they got farther and farther away from the, the grass and, and the people that moved in to do the, the actual work or people that would work for minimum wage or close to minimum wage because, I mean, what do you have to know to do grass? And, and the answer really is you have to know a lot but you don't have to apply it that often. So uh, you, you need a specialist and you need a laborer. And, and as a general rule, uh, those two terms are, are, you know, they're, they're, uh, they don't go together at all. So uh, if, if, if you know people that, that want to really do a, a, a career and do somebody a big favor, this, this would be a great business to go in. And, and you could do a little landscaping, a little little lawn work, uh, and and there isn't anybody out there that I know of doing those things that that really does a great job. So that that would be a super place to to start. Yeah, I know people will ask us for recommendations about well, who should I call? Who would do a good job cutting my grass? Who does a really good job fertilizing? my lawn and taking care of pests and everything. And I really don't have anybody honestly to recommend. I do know of some good legitimate tree services that have arborists, you know, board certified arborists as an owner or, you know, um, high up running things. So they do more than just chop and drop, you know, trees and haul them off. But yeah, lawn services, it's hard to find somebody who's really knowledgeable and good at solving, good at identifying problems, number one, and knowing how to solve them, number two. You know, landscaping, um, since we're on the, the subject, landscaping is, is one of those things. I get a tremendous number of people that call and, and they want landscaping advice. And the, the problem with doing landscaping advice over the phone is that it's very difficult to understand what the people want to accomplish. You, you have to get into their head and, and, and find out what they're actually wanting and then try and put plants mm -hmm. to that. And, and the ability to do that is, is uh, very, very limited. Uh, there, there aren't many people that can do it. If, if you're good at it, that, that would be a, another thing. You know, if you're artistic and, and you work well mm -hmm. with people, which I'm neither, uh, that, that would really be a, a good place to go. And, you know, that you, you see something that, that's well done. It, it, uh, they did a great job of landscaping thing. They picked all the right plants. They, they put them in the right places. And it, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It, you, you, you look at that pick particular piece of property and you say, my God, that is really neat. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to copy that. Well, the truth is those ideas don't necessarily reflect what you're going to do or what your property needs. You need somebody that that can listen to what you have and then artistically put it together in, in plants. And, and that's unbelievably hard to do. So, uh, you know, you want to be a landscaper? That would be a good thing. Yeah, especially with new home construction and with the way the state is growing. It's always a good time to get involved in that. Um, very important that you know what you're doing, that you understand soils and plants and locations and what's going to do well where. And I think it's probably just as important to be able to tell people, no, you can't have that. So when people start asking, I want a whole front bed of hostas out front because that's what I had in Michigan. You can yeah. tell them, no, you can't have that. It's not going to work. Uh, you know, I could buy them, I could put them in the ground, they're going to be dead in a few days. <laughs> because there are certain plants that, you know, people might want, they might have had them and enjoyed them in another state or up north, but they're just not going to do well here. 
Well, it's like azaleas. You know, uh, uh, azaleas are beautiful, and, and a, a big, massive azalea bush. All yeah, for, for is, two, is, three weeks in the spring, that's it. They're green bushes the rest of the year. But then you're going to have it sitting there for the rest of the time. And and there are places where you can landscape, and, and that green wall looks good. And, and when the green wall is in bloom, it looks good. But for most people, you know, if, if you attempted to do the, the green wall, uh, it, it just looks out of place. And uh, and yet they come in, oh, my gosh, I love my azaleas. Those, those are great. But there again, it, it's the, the right plant in the right place. And the number one rule in Florida friendly is, is one of the hardest rules to follow. And, and it's one of the hardest rules to get really good information on. Colby needs to do a class on that sometime. On well, what's that like specific? Right, what topic right are you? In the right place because you can't state that enough. Oh sure, I think that's the most important. Uh, that's the most important one of any of the principles is making sure that. Uh, not only like geographically, you're putting the right plant in the right place. You're not, don't take something from up north and put it down here, but also don't plant, you know, if you're trying to, you don't want to plant a, uh, something that can't tolerate the shade in the shade or something that, you know what I mean? Like, or something that does tolerate the shade, you don't want to put it in, in the sun when you could put it somewhere else that might be a little bit better. It's all about like, you even have to go down to like a micro chasm of your yard and think about what's the most efficient place to put, uh, to put each plant. It's, it's super important. And there's a whole guidebook on it, um, that I will give you if you ask me for it, I will I'll come to the office. I'll, I'll drop, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, give you one. Um, I was going to mention there it is. And th yeah. we even, yeah, I'm getting, well, I, I'm, I'm handing them out. Um, but we have a new one that that looks that looks nice. It's a pretty. They got a new design on them. That's the one that I personally use uh, when people call me my little reference book. It's got all my notes and stuff in it. Um, I was gonna ask when uh, we're looking at these alternative ground covers. I think it kind of goes back to what we we're talking about earlier. With maybe you're not required to have St. Augustine grass. I've heard of some, and you guys are a little bit more knowledgeable than me on exactly what this. Like, what are some good options? Well, I've seen a lot of people mentioning uh, mondo grass varieties that grow a little bit a little bit shorter. They're they're maxing out at like three inches. I know you can plant them in the shade. I was wondering if maybe that's a good option for people who have a lot of shade in their yard. Maybe that mondo yeah. is is a pretty grass, uh, and and if you you know they're getting if 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 you Take the concept of I just want to replace the grass with mm -hmm. something. There probably isn't anything that actually works to just replace the grass. Mm -hmm. But if you want to landscape and replace the grass in the landscape, there are a lot of things that work. So uh, Mondo would, would be really nice if you were going to put a, a, an island and mm -hmm. if you were going to use Mondo uh, as, as the trim in the island, you're going to put one bush in the middle of your island and, and trim with Mondo. That would really look nice. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that would work. Uh, uh, and, and especially if you had a shady area, uh, you, you've got some big trees and, and half the day uh, the big trees keep you from getting any direct sun. That would work great. Uh, there, there are things like eco turf, the, the perennial peanut. Perennial mm -hmm. peanut is, is a, a really good ground cover. It's got little yellow flowers, uh, turns brown when it gets frosted, comes back. So if, if, if you understand that, that one, you're going to have little green flowers and you don't, or little yellow flowers and you don't mind little yellow flowers, that might be a suitable alternative. But it depends on the particular individual. You can't just go out and say, replace the grass with mm -hmm. eco turf or, or perennial peanut. That really isn't going to work with a lot of people. It's going to be great for probably 20% of the people. There you go. Many acres and it's carefree. 
Yep. I, I've I've just I, I've looked at these pictures of people that are using it as like a Mondo grass that is using it as a ground cover, and it's it's just like they have a whole swath of their yard planted with it. I'm like, it looks you know these are wide, real lush looking. Uh, like wide blade, real lush looking areas, and I, I, I never thought of it like that because when I think of mondo grass, it's like the little, you know, the little bushes that people plant as like a specimen, not, not, or even as like a border sometimes, but not yeah, as uh, used as a, as a border around something edging. But I mean, I'm seeing this is. I, I was looking at this the other day, and I was like, I'm waiting for plant cleaning because I have a question today, um, uh, where people are using it as a ground cover, and I was like, that's that's crazy. Well, seems it, I mean, it seems like it's use it. They do. I mean, there are a lot of different varieties of Mondo grass. I call it monkey grass. Mm -hmm. Everything from tall to very short. But the dwarf Mondo grass, if you planted enough of it and never cut it, that would work. But it would be fairly tall all the time. And you'd have mm -hmm. to be able to deal with that running a lawnmower over dwarf mondo grass obviously if you cut it too short it will probably all up and die on you yeah. mm -hmm. um but to, to try to trim the top and just make it level because you know the best looking lawn isn't the shortest it's the most level and straight mm -hmm. across so whether you're cutting it four inches high six inches high as long as it's level it looks well maintained i don't know what the highest setting for any different brand of lawnmower would be. Can you go out and find a mower that cuts six inches high? Yeah. Well, Maybe I mean, I'm, I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing a lot of these varieties that only grow three inches tall. And I wonder, you know, these are smaller leaves. They might need a little bit more sun. Uh, I, it, it was just interesting to me. I was like, I was like, man, that's uh it's kind of crazy that they're covering this much area was something that I never thought of, uh, thought of like that. It's just, I, I hear so many people, uh, complaining about their St. Augustine grass. And it's really got me thinking about something that's not St. Augustine at all that HOAs would tolerate. Yeah, because people love St. Augustine when it turns out well and it works mm -hmm. correctly. If it doesn't, it can be very, very expensive. You have big dead areas, people flip out. Then they want to water more and they get tickets and they flip out. So uh, a lot of people don't like Bahia. They call it pasture grass and it just doesn't look good. Doesn't look as nice. My neighborhood's nice. I can't have that Bahia in my neighborhood because I live in a <laughs> nice neighborhood. So there's a lot of, um, we need to talk about the Mondo grass, um, figure out what variety, you know, uh, we can dig up and plant a little, whether it's one square foot or a hundred square mm -hmm. feet or whatever, patch out front here and see how it does. Sure. Cause I, I have a crummy soil here at the office. We have this is and weeds. We'll slam some Mondo grass in and see if it lives and see how it looks. It's something I've actually, I've done a surprise. Uh, Rarely do I come across something that I'm like, I'm I'm not at work and I'm researching this, and I was like, man, this is this is interesting, and I'm I end up reading reading about it. So I man, I have a list of different varieties. It was I was super super interested with it. I we'll, we'll talk about. It. it seems like a good idea, something I'd like yeah. to do anyway. And I see that you put up um a link to information on fog fruit. In my yard, I have a lot of fog fruit. This past year in the really dry, like late winter, early summer, we had a really dry period. A lot of it died back. It's coming back a little bit, but I used to have a lot more of it. And fog fruit is great in it, because we have a lot of it in the area where we park the RV and we let the dogs go out to take care of business. So it doesn't have to be beautiful turf grass. It's more for, you know, utility. And a lot of fog fruit out there, boy, it attracts a lot of butterflies. I always get the um, the one of the ones that come out really late summer, early fall. They're whitish um, crescent or um, peacock. The white peacock butterflies come out, and it's a host plant for them also. Frog fruit, frog fruit, or fog fruit, or however you want to call it. Um, it goes by a couple of different names. Is great. For attracting butterflies 
Uh, covers the ground well, makes for an effective ground cover. Although, um, obviously, during a really, really dry period or a drought, it's going to get knocked back quite a bit. Yeah, it it looks have... very swampy. I've, 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 I've seen this before, but I didn't know the name of it. Yeah, I, I have uh, uh, mimosa, scrutulosa, and bahia grass. And the uh, bahia looks really good in, in the summer, and it pretty much covers all the mimosa. In, in the winter, when the, the bahia drops out of the picture, the uh, mimosa strigolosa pops up, and, and it really covers, and it, and it looks beautiful. And I don't mind the little pink puffballs. I think they look kind of cute. If, if, if you had anything against looking out and seeing a field of little puffballs of pink, you probably wouldn't like it. But... It, in my case, I think that works out real well because it it covers the the problems both ways. I I have uh, a really nice uh, green uh, in, in the winter when the bahia is not at its peak, and I have beautiful grass in the summer when grass should be at its peak. And mm -hmm. and you mow it, and and both sides are very happy when they get mowed. One of the things I don't do is is mow very often the uh, uh i i go as long as i can between mowings and uh, I, I let the uh, bahia reseed itself if, if you don't if, if you keep bahia well mowed uh it thins out and every place it thins it adds weeds and eventually it becomes a very weedy not nice looking grass so i think that's where bahia uh gets its uh big bad wrap is in the fact that, that people keep it mowed and they mow it too much. You know, if, if you want to mow it and then do that, if you want to keep it really short, uh, that's fine. But if you do, then you need to reseed every year. So, uh, and I moved. If, if you oh, don't sorry. overseed, it's just going to keep thinning and thinning and thinning. And eventually yeah. you got half the hay and half weeds. And, and, and obviously that's not really pretty because when you mow it, it it's a rough textured it's green but it's only green at 30 feet i uh i moved into my house in september and uh i've only mowed one i mowed the front twice and the back once since september so like the first of september and i would say my yard is 85 percent the hail with we with a little bit of weeds here and there depending on um, what, uh, they, they, like, I have, a, I have a little, like, whole thing, like, some utility thing, I don't know what it is, and it's got, it's got some weeds around it that, that I'm not back with the weed eater the last time I did it, but, uh, I, I think you're, like, I mean, I know you're right with the, you know, if you don't mow as much, you, you don't give those other species, the undesirable species, if you will, a chance to get in, because the, the behavior is really strong, it's growing well. And it, it tends to shade out the weeds if you let it get tall. In other words, if, if you have areas that you don't have to mow, uh, I've, I've got five acres. Uh, I've got an acre that is, is around the house and, and near the, the road, and, and I keep it mowed no more than I have to. But the other, the other part of the lawn, uh, I've got a lot of trees. There is no grass. Then there's another probably acre and a half that only gets mowed two or three times a year and and the interesting thing is that when i i started it was almost all weeds and a little bahia and now it's pretty much all bahia and almost no weeds if, if you let it go to seed and you let it shade out the weeds uh you know uh, every once in a while i'd get a really tall weed i'd go out and i'd pull that one and uh, you know the, the that's probably as good a grass as, as we can get with a minimum amount of care but hey it works works great for the lazy person and you can't get any lazier than i am so i i really like it yeah and if you have a really sandy dry spot that you just want to fill in especially if it's on a hill and especially if you live really close to the coast um, railroad vine, 
great plant. A couple years ago, we did a project with a local school. We had a couple plants left over. And I think I had like three little railroad vines and each, it was just a little plant, little three inch pot, took them over to our master gardener nursery, planted them in a little spot. They're all over the place now. Gets nice, big, beautiful flowers. This is the kind of thing that you see on the beaches, on the dunes that help to hold the sand in and hold the dunes in place. Fantastic. It does not replace a lawn. You don't, you can't run over with a lawnmower or anything like that. But I know that sometimes people will have in their backyard uh, a little bit of a hill, drop off, very sandy. What can I put in? Because I'm getting a lot of erosion problems. Railroad vine will grow in pure beach sand. It grows in the worst soil. <laughs> and it flowers, and it looks pretty, too. Now, didn't this all go back to a uh, landscaper would really be nice to be able to come up with all this? I love my gopher tortoises. I've got probably 15 of them in five acres now. We have a couple in our neighborhood, and the poor things go up and down the street. They love my yard. They'll always find something to chew on, a weed or something growing or going on. Which is great. Um, the other day I walked outside first thing in the morning and there were two turkeys in my yard and they walked down the street. Just and, you know, and I, I get the um, the flocks of the different um, spoonbill, the saltwater birds and surprising amount of wildlife. And they all like my yard. They all stop over like. Oh, hey, look, he's got seeds and he's got weeds and he's got stuff we can eat and look around for bugs. And I don't spray anything. I don't fertilize. I don't water. I don't do any of that. Um, I I meet all of my goals with my lawn. Because if I haven't told people before, my wife said, I don't care what you grow out there. I don't want to see any dirt. So make sure you have, you know, the dirt covered and you keep it cut on a regular basis, and I'll be happy. I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't water. Yeah, when it gets really dry for a few months, mine turns brown along with all the neighbors. I have maybe 75% bahia, 25% random weeds, a lot, a lot of patches of frog fruit, some other patches of wild Bermuda, the weedy Bermuda, but that's in the backyard in the dog area. And that's really tough. I mean, it does take a lot to kill it. So it does a good job of covering that sand and that dirt. And I mean, I have my my requirements and my goals for my lawn and my lawn generally meets them. So we're good. You know, if you live in an HOA neighborhood and you have completely different rules and laws and requirements and goals, that's fine. We'll help you get to where you need to be too. So if you ever want to come in and get a hold of Bernie, he's here on Thursdays. You like how I kind of segue into that, Bernie? Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah. And you're always welcome to give Bernie a call. Like I said, he's here pretty much all day Thursday. You can call and ask him questions. You can bring in lawn samples. You can bring in bugs and leaves off your plants if you're having a problem. So feel free to stop by. And something that we don't mention an awful lot, Monique says that she has some centipede grass mixed in with her St. Augustine. Centipede is a great grass. It's very slow growing, almost never gets very tall. So you don't have to mow it very often at all. Covers the ground well and it's, it's not used very much here in central florida it's much more of a north florida and areas north of their grass technically here it's too warm yet some people here do have some centipede i wouldn't recommend going out and trying to resod your yard with centipede i don't even know if you can get sod here for centipede you can get seed and you could try it but if you are lucky enough to have centipede it's great looks like grass covers the ground well the only pest it has is a type of scale and that's a problem up in the panhandle not so much here in central florida there there are a couple of centipede lawns uh north of brooksville uh 
they, they don't do well in, in the uh, more open uh, sandy areas that we've got, but uh, uh, there's, there's some more clay uh, shaded areas that centipede seems to, to do reasonably well just, just north of Brooksville. And it's uh, the only areas I found where it worked. So for the most part, that, that's not a good recommendation in Hernando County. Yeah, and normally, um, if you have a mixed lawn, centipede might just be part of the mix. You have centipede along with a number of other things. You don't, I, I've never seen a pure centipede lawn here, although I know that they do grow it and recommend it up in, from the panhandle, and I'm not sure how far north you can grow it. And before anybody mentions it, zoysia. Zoysia is a beautiful grass when you first put it down. And it gets established and it greens up. It's beautiful. Couple weeks, couple months, you know, um, maybe six months or so. If you don't manage it 100% perfect correctly, it will go south on you. It will crash. It will look horrible. It will get expensive and you will not be happy. And please don't be putting in zoysia thinking that well you know if it doesn't work out right i'll just call bernie or i'll call bill or i'll call colby because i am not a zoysia expert fortunately very few people here in hernando county have it yeah I, you know, according you know zoysia to gets mole crickets yeah according to uh, the university uh they they have a, a study on grasses uh, throughout the, the whole state, and, and they claim that uh, centipede uh, is the majority grass north of Gainesville. I could see that. Yeah. So St. Augustine has grown an awful lot in southern Florida, but when they're getting normal rainfall, that works just fine. St. Augustine does great in certain areas, depending on the soil. A few months ago, we went to an RV park down on the northern side of Tampa, right very, very close to um, Tampa Bay. And in the park, they had very nice landscaping between spots. They had a lot of tropical plants. They had St. Augustine grass. It, was just, it wasn't a big lawn. It was just in little strips and little areas. And I looked at it. I walked over to it. I didn't have a ruler to measure it, but when I put my hand in that grass, the grass came all the way up to about here. It had to be like six to eight inch deep St. Augustine grass. Look, I don't know how they kept it that high. I don't know what they used to cut it with. Absolutely perfect. Not a single weed anywhere because it was so thick that there was no way a weed seed could ever find the dirt to germinate in. No diseases. No problems, no dead spots, deep, beautiful, perfect little patch of St. Augustine. Don't know how they accomplished it. <laughs> they obviously have a way of cutting it really, really high. Whether it's weed eating really high, which is difficult to do, you're always tempted to weed eat low, or mowers that are small enough that they get into those little strips there. But you can do it. Probably not in Spring Hill, though not the right soil yeah if people did that if, if there was six inch high uh saint augustine in in our county that would be a really nice grass that, that would have, and then have a decent enough root structure it would always be getting water that, you know that people don't don't comprehend that if if the blade is short the root is short if the yep. root is short the, the, you know, the top couple mm -hmm. of inches run out of water really quick and then the lawn's under stress and it's not getting enough water because you mowed it too short. That, that really doesn't seem like they go together. But uh, if, if, if the longer the blade is, the more water it gets uh, because the longer the root out is. And uh, this, this little bag of, of grass here has four inch, five inch roots, which means that they mowed it more than two inches, but not continuously at six or eight inches. 
or or even four inches. So uh, it, it it really changes dramatically. That that next two inches uh, buys you a, a tremendous amount in in length of life. You know, if, if you mow it two inches, you can almost be assured that every three years you're going to end up spending really big money on the St. Augustine lawn. So if you like it's to, very. Uh, it's very cyclical, you know. Your uh, your 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 blades are long and healthy. Your roots will go deep, so they'll keep they'll be getting your water and your nutrients to keep those blades healthy. Um, the same way that uh, if you're you mow too short, your roots get short. They don't they can't take up enough water and nutrients to keep those blades healthy. Your grass ends up dying. It's a uh, it's it's all a system that works together. That's like most things uh, that have to do with plants. It's a it's a big system that works together, and you have to maintain every part of that system for it to function. Um, yeah, the the, the sandy soil. The away. biggest problem with sandy soil is it doesn't have any organic material. Mm -hmm. And and you add organic material uh, to soil by planting things with lots of roots. The the organic material doesn't come from the the Clippings dying because they, they tend to deteriorate and you get some nutrients back, but you don't get any organic material into mm -hmm. the soil. But if you get a lot of root structure, uh, you build up organic material in the soil and everything benefits. It starts holding things better. It stays moist longer. Uh, your plants get more water. It just it's, it's, it's all cyclic. It's amazing how all these things tie together. You know, what we need to think about doing is resodding the front of the office and do it with St. Augustine and get some Hernando County compost to, to work in before we put the sod down. Go out and find a lawnmower that's going to cut six inches high and actually do it. And then when people have questions about lawns or they want to they want to get nasty and angry, I have to water my lawn five, six, seven times a week. Otherwise, it's going to die we could actually give people um, a positive example and track everything, track it all very closely and put it all on a post out front. This is how much we water. This is how often we fertilize. Not much. <laughs> this is how high we cut it. This is what it looks like. You want a lawn that looks like ours? Do what we did. If you guys are going to do something different, you get what you get. Thanks for stopping by. I wonder if you put a sign out there, like on the walkway up to the door that shows, that says that. I wonder how many people will just turn around and leave without going in and asking you. Yeah. Well, let them know that it, it can be done. You know, you can, it can be done. But if you manage your lawn incorrectly and your lawn dies and you resod it and you continue to manage it incorrectly, you're just going to get the same result. Mm -hmm. And you can do it over and over and over and over again as many times as you want. But it's not going to change. It's you can grow. I mean, you know, yeah. I need to. I need to look into that. We'll have to put in an irrigation system, and then we can very carefully track how many gallons of water we use over whatever time period. I would only fertilize it lightly twice a year, following the fertilizer ordinance. We have to find a lawnmower that actually cuts four inches or even better, taller, and. Uh, I guess we'd be cutting it ourselves because we have a lawn service that cuts it right now. They they trash it. <laughs> they make a mess. <laughs> most most of the small mowers will mow will cut it three inches if you go all the way up. But the trick is you get bigger wheels. You can, yeah. you, can you can pick up another inch by putting on bigger wheels. So Corey, um, they do have the county does have compost at. Osawa, the um, the station there. Hernando County is in the process of making compost on a commercial scale. So they've gotten some grants. I'm involved in a grant for uh, public education, part of them making compost and making it available to Hernando County residents. And they're hoping in less than a year for that compost to be available. And one place where hopefully a lot of it will go is either to top dress people's existing St. Augustine lawns or to put down before you put the St. Augustine turf down. So that's something that they're working on. Um, looks like everybody woke up all of a sudden. Monique, 
thank you. Yeah, you know, that idea just kind of came to me. It's like, well, you know, everybody looks at when I tell people how they should go about doing it, they always look at me like I'm nuts. Maybe I'll just show them what you could do with a lawn if you do things correctly. Um, zero turn mowers and the larger riding mowers, you probably could get bigger tires. And with the blade and the deck, you can shim them. You could put a bunch of spacers in there. I'd have to shop around to find one that you could actually really legitimately end up with at least six inch tall grass blades. That's gonna be that's gonna be one of your 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 bigger ones. Your bigger than your big deck, like the massive, uh, bigger than like your forty two inch. Because I think the forty two inch my dad has the it, his toilet goes up to four and a half inches. So you're not gonna get six. Definitely, you know that's that's within our specification. But if you want six, you you're gonna have to get a really big mower uh, to be able to do it with the setting without having to jerry rig anything. Most of the zero turns, I just bought one not too long ago. Four and a half inches is about as high as they go. And mm, yeah. That's only if they have recommended tire pressure. So if, yes. if you buy one and and you start out and it's four and a half inches at the beginning of the season, I think you'll find it unless you have an air compressor and check the tires regularly. By the end of the season, you're mowing at three and a half or three inches. Front tires tend to go down. You don't notice it. Back tires just lose a little bit, and and so you you drop a an inch in the front, and you drop a half inch from the back, and and you really lose uh, mow height quick just from tire pressure. You know, before we go, we're we're about out of time. Bill, what should I be planting in my garden now? And uh, <laughs> you got any other advice on on the plants that this would be a good time to stick them in the ground? Right now, you need to be actively planting all your cool season vegetables. And if you're wondering, well, what does that include? I did a class just a couple weeks ago, I think. And it is on Hernando County Government's YouTube. So let me go ahead and don't kill yourself trying to write down that entire link. If you go to YouTube, look at the little search box up at the top. Go to Hernando County Government. They have a YouTube channel and it's broken up into playlists. And one of them is for Hernando County Extension. And we have one on cool season vegetable gardening. So there's so much that you can plant and grow right now. Everything from radishes to anything green and leafy, lettuce, Swiss chard, kale, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, um, kohlrabi, if anybody's familiar with that, I've tried kohlrabi. It's really pretty good. Um, turnips, any kind of greens. So all those different cool season vegetables, start planting them right now. I just the other day started uh, harvesting my sweet potatoes. And I have a big patch and I only got just a few feet into it. I got quite a few sweet potatoes already. I'll, I'll get a picture of how many I end up harvesting out of my patch. It looks like they came out pretty good. There, I got little ones. I got big ones. I got in between ones. So it, it varies a lot. Um, I have lettuce coming up. I have, what else do I have? I still have tomatoes and peppers in the ground. They're going to freeze in the not too distant future. So focus on putting in lots of lettuce, carrots, radishes, all those cool season vegetables. Very good. And as always, Go to Hernando County Government's YouTube. I've got a lot of recorded classes on there. Our previous Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator, Lily, has over 100 of them. Colby, don't you have one on there? At least one. Three. He's got, oh, you're up to three. So, see, mm -hmm. Colby's working on it. He has a little ways to go to, to get caught up. But he's getting his in there also. And if you ever want to find any of his links, contact information, Facebook page, everything else. If you go to his link tree, all those links are right there. I uh, I'm also doing a live class tomorrow. Uh, we're gonna talk about take all root rot and how it can be mistaken for things like chinch bugs and and not watering enough. <laughs> so uh, that'll broken be tomorrow. Sprinkler head. People never think broken sprinkler head, but it happens mm -hmm. all the time. Uh, I'm I I had a I had a call from a customer who had a an 
thank you. Uh, it had an, an egregiously high bill, and I was like, man, you got to probably yeah, look at your sprinkler heads, see if you got a wet spot. It's funny you mentioned that. Um, yeah, so please visit the link tree. Please uh, come, uh, c- come and join me on Friday mornings at 1030. Okay, looks like it's that time for us to go ahead and wrap it up. But one last quick question here from Anne Marie. Am I going to replant the sweet potato bed? No, because sweet potatoes do really, really well during the heat of summer. What I do is when I harvest all my sweet potatoes, I end up getting a number of them that are really, really small. I'm thinking, well, I'm not going to try. This is too small to work with to cook. I save them in a box in the garage where they stay cool. By late winter, early spring, they're starting to sprout on their own. I'll usually take them and put them into pots, uh, you know, like three-gallon pot or a tray of soil. They start sending out more shoots. Those are the shoots that I clip off and plant next summer's sweet potato patch with. So this is my either second or third crop of sweet potatoes. From my original, I went to the store, I went to Winn-Dixie and bought three sweet potatoes. So that's what they've all come from. And I'll see if I can't keep this going for a few more years. So the, the little ones turn into next year's starters to hopefully turn into big ones. And if you've never grown sweet potatoes before, it's really easy. Do it during the summer. You don't even really have to weed it. You got to water it if it's a really dry summer like it was this year. But very, very, very easy to grow. And University of Florida even says that Colby is awesome. So on that note, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, We are going to be back again next Thursday at 10 a.m. So if you have any questions, save them up until then. Email them to me. Email them to Colby. Call Bernie. We're here to help. More than happy to help. And until next Thursday at 10 a.m., Everybody take care and we'll see you then. Bye, guys. Bye. Have a good one.